So, uh, as far as things go regarding antennas, now, I have these little cheat sheets, these printouts that I'm going to try to scan and put in as a PDF file for you. If not, I'll uh, take a picture of it and post it on the screen, makes it a little more clear than what you can see right now of me just holding it up. However, um, antenna terms, it's very important to understand what your antenna is doing. Now, when it comes to parts of a radio, there are three main components that you always have to look at whenever you're troubleshooting, right? The radio itself, the handset, and the antenna to include the, uh, to include the RF cable that's connected to it. If you don't have these three things working in conjunction, you're not going to be able to transmit. Radios aren't like cell phones. You can't just pick it up, dial a number, and then call. You need to make sure that these components work because if your handset's not properly secured, your handset's, uh, the microphone in your handset's not working, the speaker in your handset's not working, the push to talk, the button on your handset's not working, you're not going to talk to anyone. Same thing with the radio. If the radio's not on, you're not going to talk to anyone. I know it's dumb, I know it sounds silly, but I've seen it before. You need to be able to make sure that these components work properly. And one of the part, and a part of that is understanding what antennas are and what the terms that I'm about to go through mean. Now again, uh, as much with most of the stuff through these videos, this should all be review, but if it's not something you've heard of before or it's been a while since you've actually taken the time to read through this, um, please just follow along, skip over the stuff that you already know. So, uh, starting off with our antenna terms, we're gonna start off with the first one, field expedient antenna. Now, this is one of my biggest pet peeves because a FIA and a FEEK are two different things. A FEEK is an actual kit, it's sold by Harris. There's gonna be a picture of it somewhere on the screen. Um, if your unit is Gucci with it and they have a little extra money to spend money on this, then congratulations, it's a pretty neat kit. You're able to run around with it and use it for however many times you need to. I've never been privy to one. Oh, that's not true, but I've never been privy to one when I actually needed it. So what you're most likely gonna be building is a FIA. Now a FIA stands for a field expedient antenna and the antenna length is relevant to the wavelength. All antennas have a radiation pattern. Field expedients should not be referred, should not be used for free cop or frequency hopping. All FIAs or field expedient antennas will improve gain and is better to use on single channel wavelengths than the SL3 antennas. SL3 antennas, again, they're here on the screen somewhere. Those are the antennas that come with your radio. They are made to be in that frequency range, but they're not made specifically for the frequency that you're shooting. So that's why if you're able to build a field expedient antenna, or uh, we like to call it Christmas tree wire, you're gonna have better gain, you're gonna have better clarity when you're actually transmitting and a higher chance of sending your, your uh, transmission further, right, than if you have an SL3 antenna. So it's important to know which antennas you're using and it's important to make sure that you're cutting those antenna lengths down to size. And we're gonna go over the actual calculations for those antenna lengths in probably another video. Omnidirectional, now these are the directions of how your antenna propagates, right? Different antennas propagate differently. And it's important to know because of what you're trying to do and who you're trying to talk to. Also, to keep in mind, OPSEC, right? If you're transmitting on a um, with an omnidirectional antenna with very high frequencies and very high power, more often than not, anyone with a SDR will be able to actually look by and see, wow, there is a lot of frequencies being emitted from this direction. They're gonna probably come and uh, let their Intel at let their Intel guys know, and you just allowed yourself to get caught by the enemy just because you were not able to understand how these antenna elements radiate. Same thing when it comes to reaching the most amount of people, because there's always a flip side, right? If you're somewhere where you're stuck, you need help, and you have two different kinds of antennas, one that's bi-directional, one that's omnidirectional, if you're trying to hit as many people as you can, you're gonna probably wanna use the omnidirectional. There's different scenarios where each antenna would be more preferable than the other. So omnidirectional, in all directions, bi-directional, two directions, and unidirectional, one direction. Now it is possible to have other different kinds of antennas that have different types of radiation properties, but for now we're just gonna focus on those three because those are the three that we mostly use. Impedance, so impedance is the measure of how difficult it is for current to flow through a conductor. So if you have an antenna that has a very, very uh, high impedance, more likely than not, you're wasting power on actually trying to transmit through that antenna or whatever it is that you created to make that field expedient. So it's not so easy to be able to just grab something like a spoon or a metal fork 
and somehow jerry-rig it into your radio. You have to be able to use the actual antenna wires that we um, use in the military, or if you're civilian, be able to go out and buy the antenna wire that's most apt for transmitting an actual signal. Which leads on to the conductor. Any material, which is usually metal, which has a low resistance to the flow of electrical current, right? So copper, most of our antennas are made out of copper. There's one that has steel inside of it, and that one's not as good as the one that's copper. If we were fancy enough and rich enough to be able to use gold, we would, but we don't. Insulator, so an insulator is a device or material that has a high electrical resistance or a non-conductor of electricity. They prevent the supporting elements of the antenna from becoming part of the electrical element of the antenna. So I'll go with the examples first and I'll explain them. So the best insulators that we have is glass, plastic, or rubber, right? I recommend either using an MRE bag or a spoon. Those MRE spoons, the plastic spoons, it's really easy to be able to grab something as simple as a lighter, right? You grab your lighter, you put it over the spoon, you melt that first part of the spoon, poke your antenna through it, tie it, and now you have something that you can use effectively as a long wire. You know, give it to a junior marine, have him run out in a certain direction, and just literally move with the antenna, simple enough. Or if you're tying it to a tree, or tying it to a canteen, and you throw it up over a tree, and then you have um, your ability to make a long wire. So those are my biggest suggestions, an MRE bag or a plastic spoon. If you wanna be fancy and go out and buy this stuff by yourself, a uh, PVC pipe is great, or having a couple extra bottles, like, like uh, Coke bottles, soda bottles, and you can do the same thing with those. Uh, a good insulator would be wood, dry wood, because if it's wet, all of that humidity is being soaked up into that wood, and it's no longer an insulator, it's become conductive. And fair, something that is less good than dry wood, would be nylon rope or dry cloth. Now, I am a big proponent for using 550, right, or paracord. Uh, this piece right here, I've always been told, is the best part to actually use for your uh, antennas. But I personally believe that if it gets wet, it's going to get wet anyways. It's going to turn into an insul It's going to turn conductive. So my train of thought, my school of thought, is always to use something that's plastic and then tying that to your 550 cord. That is just my personal observation from when I've had to do these. So moving on, takeoff angle. Especially when working with HF, a lot of these antennas, a lot of the way that these radiation patterns, these radiation patterns propagate, they come up and out, or sometimes they radiate up and out like this. Now with HF specifically, making field expedient antennas can change the way that those propagation paths work. So a takeoff angle is the angle measured from the Earth's surface or horizontal up to the direction of propagation towards the ionosphere. It works by pushing up, hits the ionosphere, and then goes down. And I'm gonna explain that a little further with the next one, right? So the ionosphere are the layers in the atmosphere that separates into four layers. When ionized by the sun, D, E, F1, and F2, and F1 and F2 merge into one layer at night. So there's this little picture that I drew here, and actually I think I can just, I think it'd be easier for me to just take a picture and put it on the screen. No, it looks right, good right there. And look at the, looking at this diagram, you can see that this right here is your antenna. This right here is what's being radiated, and this is it hitting the actual ionosphere. It's shooting up into the sky. And that's where we start getting into talking about ghost stories and uh, lost transmissions and talking about pushing too far past the ionosphere when you're pushing too much power or not pushing enough, transmitting over across the world. I believe that the 150 is able to transmit up to a third of the Earth's circumference. Um, it's pretty crazy. Just with one small radio and a good amount of slash wire, you're able to actually transmit pretty far into the United States. I know that when we were in comm school, we were actually able to hit, I believe it was Michigan um, or Colorado. It was one of the two. But we were able to hit the states from uh, California. So it's, it's definitely possible to be able to use this equipment over long distances. Uh, NIVIS. So NIVIS stands for Near Vertical Incident Skywave. It allows for decreased skip zones and is extremely beneficial when operating in complex compartmentalized terrain. So anything that has to do with mountain ridges, anything that has to do with hills or um, structures, NIVIS is the way to go. It is, again, this is what the diagram was specifically of, of NIVIS, right? You're in the little hill, the little valley, and you want to be able to get your calm 
up and out of the actual mountain ridges. You're going to be using HF, you're going to be using Nibis in order to make that happen. We do have the ability to transmit similar, similar kind of idea using SATCOM, where you're pointing towards a satellite and you're reaching a, a different part of the world doing that. But that wouldn't technically be Nibis because it's not a... It's not an actual HF shot. You're you're literally talking to a satellite. So I know I've gotten I've gotten that question before. Of uh, are those two the same things? And no, they're not. So moving forward, we have the transmission lines. This is as simple as the actual coax cable, right? Your transmission line, the RF cable, the radio frequency cable, is what's going to carry that signal to the antenna. It's nothing crazy, but you got to remember that. If that cable is frayed on the inside, if the connectors are loose, if the connectors are stripped, you're gonna have a decrease in quality. So it's always important to check your cable, check your equipment to make sure that there's no gashes, to make sure there's no slashes or it's internally frayed. Uh, if you have a suspicion that your cable is not working, the best way to do it is take it to the techs. They have a spectrogram, uh, spec a spectrogram? I think it's a spectrogram, I don't know. They have, they have the equipment to actually test for it. So they'll hook it up to their little device They'll run a current through it and a voltmeter. I believe that's what it's called. They have a voltmeter and they'll be able to see if it's actually working properly. A balloon or a coax choke. Now this works mostly for HF. We're not really talking about antennas that you'll see in uh, uh, VHF. But it is a device for feeding a balanced load with an unbalanced line or vice versa. A balloon presents unwanted RF current flow which causes the radio to be hot and could potentially shock the operator. You can form a ballum by using a coax cable and rolling it into 10 six inch turns. So I don't think I have the, the little design for it, but I do have some 550, so I'll go ahead and use that. Where did I put the 550? Well, I have no idea where I left it. There it is. So what you do in order to balance your loads whenever you're transmitting, again, this is for HF. You grab your transmission cable, put it in your hand. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. Congratulations, you just created a ballon. Now you tie it or you get um, a zip tie or whatever you have disposable, available, and you make sure that it stays that way. Nothing crazy. Um, I personally have never had a real need for one, but whatever you do to make sure you have better comms, the better, right? Cobra head. So this is where we're getting into uh, the actual feed points that I don't have with me because I haven't stolen any. Um, <laughs> but I don't have any to show you. So this is the actual part that connects to the feed line, the RF cable, and it ties to your antennas. So we, as radio operators, are most familiar with that bad Larry right there, also known as the Cobra head. Actually, I can just put a picture of it on the screen right now. So the Cobra head, it's a feed point device which connects the antenna to the transmission line and it's capable up to 10 watts. It's very important because when you start transmitting with higher power, you're not gonna, gonna wanna be using the Cobra head, right? Um, just keep that in mind. There's the other one that we have which is called the Budwig HQ1. Again, picture on the screen somewhere. And it is a feed point device which connects the antenna to the transmission line cable, capable up to 20 watts. So whenever you're pushing anything higher than 10 watts, anything high power, you want to be using the Budwig. I know that we don't always have that luxury. I'm well aware of uh, not having the money to do the things that we need to do. Um, but Marines make do. That's part of our that's part of our mission statement. So uh, I hope these antenna terms are able to help you out in whatever it is that you're doing. It's always good to keep a, a good refresher of what these things mean because it's one of the reasons why when you're troubleshooting, you're able to refer to and have the ability to think logically. It's like, all right, well, I know that the cable that I'm using might not be right. You know, it's it's too high of, uh, of an impedance. I might need to swap that out. I know that I need to be able to transmit using a omnidirectional antenna if I need to reach the most amount of people, right? Um, they're very basic, they're very simple stuff, but it's very easy to forget about it. So with that said, I hope that this helped you out. And I will be able to have these as a PDF or as a printout for you somewhere down in the description. Other than that, I got nothing else for you, and uh, I'll see you next time.